Tonight, another Prairie Province relaxes COVID restrictions. Probably about three weeks ago, the water was kind of brown. Plus, bad water continues to plague First Nations communities. Like I say, we want to see our people succeed, you know, so that, uh, you know, that at least uh, they, they're not a burden. And online university courses will improve for First Nations students in Manitoba. Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. Blockades and protests against COVID mandates continue across the country and Prime Minister Trudeau is calling for them to end. He says the illegal occupations are hurting innocent Canadians and they cannot be allowed to continue. The border cannot and will not remain closed. I want to remind everyone that politicians don't direct police in a democratic society. But I can assure you that the RCMP is working with provincial and local police departments to enforce the law. Everything is on the table because this unlawful activity has to end and it will end. Of course, I can't say too much more now as to exactly when or how this ends because unfortunately we are concerned about violence. Trudeau says he spoke with U.S. President Joe Biden who agrees that the blockades must end. And Manitoba is the latest province to announce the easing of COVID restrictions. Premier Heather Stephenson says it has nothing to do with the protests. Manitoba joins Alberta and Saskatchewan who lifted restrictions this week. As of Tuesday, February 15th, capacity limits in many businesses and venues will lift in Manitoba, as well as indoor gathering limits. By March 1st, proof of vaccination will no longer be required. And two weeks later, on March 15th, mask mandates will end. Close contacts of a person who tests positive will not be required to isolate, but travel restrictions to northern Manitoba remain in place. Premier Heather Stephenson said today plans were always in place to remove restrictions. What, what I would say is that this has been ongoing. I mean, uh, Dr. Rusin said, uh, you know, I guess weeks ago that we were looking at um, probably the spring uh, wherein we would be removing all the restrictions. And that was before protesters were out in, you know, the front of, uh, of the legislature. So, I mean, we have been having these discussions for some time. We now we want to hear what you think about the lifting of restrictions. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. The family of an Adikamek woman is alleging neglect by staff at a long-term care home in Joliet, Quebec. Marguerite uh, Newishish died yesterday from complications related to an intestinal blockage, and her family feels it could have been caught sooner. Lindsay Richardson reports. A COVID-19 outbreak kept the Newishish family from visiting their matriarch, Marguerite, at the Joliet-based elder care home where she was living. They knew she tested positive for COVID, but when they heard her vomit was black and she'd stopped eating and drinking, they knew something else was wrong. Selon Isabelle, il attribuait ça, les symptômes qu'elle avait, il attribuait ça à la COVID, mais elle euh, était persuadée qu'elle avait d'autres choses, fait qu'elle a insisté pour euh, qu'elle soit évacuée. Thérèse Miqui is Marguerite's cousin and the family's appointed spokesperson. They're still processing the events leading up to Marguerite's death Thursday afternoon. Ça va être une grande perte pour nous autres. Puis dans le contexte là, où elle euh, va vivre ces derniers, ces derniers moments, bien, 
C'est encore plus euh, poignant. The family says they made a previous complaint about the care given at Sylvie d'Espérance, the publicly run care home. After days of allegedly pleading with doctors, the Newishish family says they had to call 911 to get Marguerite transferred to urgent care by ambulance. They say tests in hospital revealed an intestinal blockage, but they say there was nothing that could be done. Son état s'était vraiment euh, détérioré, dégradé, puis qu'il avait même eu euh, des toxines rendues au cerveau, donc elle ne réagissait plus. Il sera, je l'espère, la fondation d'un pacte social qui nous amènera à se dire plus jamais. The compounded problems in the health care system in Joliet were well documented during the coroner's inquest examining the death of Joyce Eshaquan, a mother of seven, also from Manawan. The coroner on that case is now hearing testimony in another separate inquest, this time looking into the shortcomings of Quebec's elder care system during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, il y a probablement eu le Dieu encore du racisme cette fois-ci. Le Centre intégré de la santé et de services sociaux de Lanaudière, qui oversee Sylvie L'Espérance, refused APTN's interview request. In an email response, they said complaints are confidential. So we asked about ambulance transfer protocol for patients with COVID-19, which they say varies according to the conditions and needs of each user. But the Newishish family feels Marguerite, a respected elder who spent her life working in the healthcare system as an Atikamekw interpreter, wasn't treated quickly enough. Ce qui motive la famille là, c'est que il y a des choses qui sont inacceptables, puis ils ont le droit d'avoir des réponses là, les bonnes réponses là sur qu'est-ce qui s'est passé vraiment. According to Therese, another complaint and possible legal action are in the works. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. Should a three-month jail sentence have turned into a death sentence? That's what one Wolastiquay family is asking, as their loved one, Skylar Sapier-Solomon, caught COVID behind bars at a New Brunswick Correctional Centre, eventually dying from the virus. Indra Moore reports. Skylar Brent Sapier Solomon was a father of two, a member of the Nakaguk, also known as Tobik, First Nation, and only 28 years old when he passed away on January 31st. His mother, Dora, still cannot believe it. Breaks my heart, and I just feel angry sometimes because. His family says it all started when Skyler tried to get mental health treatment. He breached his probation when he spit on a hospital security guard, resulting in three months at the St. John Correctional Center. Skyler died about two weeks before he was supposed to be released. Rayanne is Skyler's older sister and says her brother was incubated as soon as he arrived at the hospital. We don't understand why he's so sick because... He's fully vaccinated. He had a booster. He's only 28 years old. There's no underlying health conditions. Like, they just really didn't understand. His family alleges the correctional facility did not get Skylar medical attention in time. He must have been sick for a while. And I feel that they took him to the hospital way too late because he died really fast. The coroner called us they mentioned that they had given him a puffer at the jail, so I don't know. Skyler's family says he should not have been sent to the St. John Correctional Center in the first place. It had a COVID outbreak with 27 inmates and 54 staff members testing positive for COVID, according to a New Brunswick Department of Justice news release. Well, I feel if they didn't have enough uh, guards or whatever, they, sh they could have done something. They could have put him on house arrest, a house arrest or something. Instead of keeping him in there, allowing them to get sick, and allowing my son to die like that. The province of New Brunswick has ordered a coroner's inquest, something the Willistiquoi chiefs support. We hope the coroner's inquest will review whether proper COVID-19 protocols were being followed at the jail and whether timely access to care was available. However, Skylar's mother does not have faith in an inquest. Coroner's inquest, they probably just want to cover their butts. <laughs> Pardon my language, but... 
Schuyler wrote a letter to his mother two weeks before he died. The family received it just days before he passed. He wrote, I miss you guys. I wish I could come visit sometimes. I thought it would be a good idea to let you know how I am and where I am living and that I'm alive. The date of the coroner's inquest is yet to be announced. The Sapier family is hiring their own lawyer to seek legal action. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabuktuk, also known as Halifax. The Ontario Civilian Police Commission announced today that they will, that, that they will excuse me, investigate the Thunder Bay Police Service. The commission has concerns about the police service's, quote, management of discipline in the police service, the conduct of criminal investigations by its officers, and the ability of senior leadership to administer the day-to-day -day operations of the police service in good faith and in compliance with the Police Services Act. Now, these concerns are based on the results of a preliminary review conducted into the police service at the request of Solicitor General Sylvia Jones and from the Thunder Bay Police Services Board. All right, we need to, to step aside for a short break. Still to come, water woes in a Dene community. And I was like, crying, like literally crying for help to have a safe place for my kids because the smell stunk and they were like crying to use the bathroom. Welcome back. The federal NDP hopes a new private member's bill will help northern and remote First Nation communities to access much-needed infrastructure funds for projects to fight climate change. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. All-weather roads, recycling centers, and renewable energy initiatives, these are things a number of remote First Nations would like to build to fight global warming. But private funds can be hard to come by. NDP MP Nikki Ashton's Bill C-45 aims to change that. It would convert the Canada Infrastructure Bank into a sort of crown corporation, allowing these communities to access public funds for green projects. I, I'd really At like a press conference cool Friday, and, and one northern Manitoba chief says if passed, the private member's bill could allow his community to move away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. One of the benefits of seeing this bill passed would be connecting Shimadawa to the main hydro line. Right now, Shimada is dependent on burning dirty diesel in order to heat our homes, to, to turn on lights, and to generate power for the whole community. However, private members' bills rarely pass and become law. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. For the last two months, people living in the small Dene community of Edzo Northwest Territories have been dealing with brown water or no water at all. Our, our reporter Charlotte Morant Jacobs traveled there to find out more. Here's that story. Kelsey Mantla can't predict how long she'll have running water for. What she does know is that it's challenging to go without, especially with four young kids. The 200 person Klinchow community of Edzo, Northwest Territories, has been dealing with water issues since mid January. There was a leakage coming from somewhere they didn't know. So they had to turn the water off again. And then they had it dull, like a little bit of water like coming out. But the water was also yellow and sandy. And that was on for like a week. Raw sewage came up for days on end. Like every time I tried to like scoop water out of there, and it ends up like keep going. And I was like... Crying, like literally crying for help to have a safe place for my kids because the smell stunk and they were like crying to use the bathroom. She says she's repeatedly paid to have her pipes thawed. Like a month, I think we paid over, I mean, like close to a thousand dollars just to get them to unthaw the sewer and our water. Every few days, Alicia Chocolate Smith drives an hour to Yellowknife, so her household of eight has clean drinking and cooking water. Probably about three weeks ago, the water was kind of brown. Like, I noticed it in the toilet, like it was brown, and I didn't want to brush my teeth because it's coming out brown from the sink. Community members APTN spoke with say aging infrastructure has been a long-standing issue here. Around this time, it's always like this, and it's usually when the river begins to, like, 
thaw out, that's when it comes back, I guess. But yeah, the water treatment plant in Edo is pretty old and it does need to be changed. The Klingcho government says the treatment plant's backwash pump failed. In the process of replacing the parts, the reservoir drained and resulted in discoloration and slowed water pressure. It, it is uh, a system that is gradually deteriorating because it's old and uh, we have uh, brought it up uh, during our community government's uh, council meeting that uh, this is something we have to seriously look at and possibly reprioritize our strategic plan. For Kelsey Matla, she's hoping for more support. And I'm pretty sure there's like lots of rooms at the hotel. They should at least like put us there for like a week or so. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, ABTN National News, Edzo. It's time for one more break, but still ahead. Learning hubs for post-secondary students will soon be coming to First Nation communities. I know a lot of people out there have the potential to succeed and uh, you know now with this hub you have the tools now. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Our regular contributor Greg Scriver sent in this great photo from the shoreline of the Ottawa River capturing a beautiful golden orange sunset. That's a great photo Greg. Keep those photos coming by sending your photos to share at aptn.ca and you, may, you might be featured in our next photo of the day. All right, now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting over in the east, plus 8 in Charlottetown and plus 11 in Halifax. Minus 16 in snow in Nain and minus 10 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Minus 22 in Rouen, Noranda and minus 22 in Val d'Or. Snow and minus 17 in North Bay and minus 18 in Sault Ste. Marie. Minus 22 in Big Trail Lake and minus 19 in Wawa. Minus 27 in Churchill and minus 20 in Norway House. Minus 18 in Barron's River and minus 14 in Dauphin. Minus 5 in Swift Current and minus 11 in Saskatoon. Minus 16 in snow in La Ronge and a minus 24 in snow in Stony Rapids. Over in the west, a minus 18 in flurries in Fort Chippewan and plus 5 in Grand Prairie. Plus 5 in sunshine in Edmonton and plus 6 in Medicine Hat. Plus 6 in sun in Penticton and plus 6 in Quinnell. Minus 4 in Fort Nelson and plus 4 in Smithers. Minus 24 in Rock River and plus 2 in Whitehorse. Snow and minus 23 in Norman Wells and minus 10 in Snow and Trout Lake. Minus 28 and it looks like Sleet in Fort McPherson and minus 26 in Colville Lake. Minus 37 in Cambridge Bay and minus 30 in Chesterfield. Minus 34 in Resolute and minus 25 in Iqaluit. A new partnership between the MasterCard Foundation and the University of Manitoba will help Indigenous students with post-secondary online learning. Here's more on how the partnership hopes to change Indigenous education. I think we have the, the people that have the capabilities, you know, to, uh, to attain their teaching degrees and every other degree. Like, we want to be a part of society. Soon First Nations students in Manitoba won't have to leave their community to attend post-secondary school. In partnership with the Interlake Reserves Tribal Council, which represents six First Nations in Manitoba, $16.1 million is being committed to the University of Manitoba through the MasterCard Foundation and will help build learning hubs in First Nations communities. You know, a lot of times uh, our people are put on the back burner because there's not enough uh, uh, post-secondary dollars to go around. But here, having, having the hub now, uh, you know, there's more people that can further their education because I know a lot of people out there have the potential to succeed. And, uh, you know, now with this hub, you have the tools now. The hubs will provide students better internet access, laptops, and books for their post-secondary education. Dr. Catherine Cook is Métis and the Vice President Indigenous at the U of M. She says universities should support communities. The university is not just a post-secondary education deliverer. Um, it really needs to be there to support the community, to support the 
the ability for students to move from high school into university, to move from university out to employment. So we are that transitional bridge between those worlds. And it's our goal, it's our hope that we can really build on that and uh, provide the kind of structure and system that really does support our Indigenous students and their ability to achieve success in that way. Penemutang First Nation will be the first community to develop a hub. More hubs will be coming to communities across Manitoba over the next few years. This is a three-year project, so what we're trying to do and what we're, you know, we're, we're going to do is we're going to have a hub in every community. So every First Nation will have their own on the Interlake area. And, uh, you know, like I say, we want to see our people succeed, you know, so that, uh, you know, at least, uh, hey, we're not a burden. The project is not limited to university and will be open to any post-secondary school within Manitoba, including trades and technology. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Tonight on Investigates, Josh Grummet takes a look at a landmark Supreme Court decision. In Southwind v. Canada, the Supreme Court laid, laid down new guidelines for how specific claims should be compensated. And with almost 500 claims in progress across Turtle Island, the implications are enormous. He joins us now. Josh, thanks for joining us here today. No problem. So what's important about the Southwind decision specifically? Uh, it relates to the flooding of the Laxall First Nation in the 1930s and a specific claim that arose as a result of that filed by Roger Southwind. Uh, it's rare to see a specific claim like this go all the way to the Supreme Court, but this one did. And specifically, the Supreme Court basically told Canada to go back and pay Laxall First Nation more than what they previously did. They told uh, Canada to compensate Laxall at the highest possible value of the land, not just the minimum. Uh, and there's also specific language about how the trial judge focused on what Canada would likely have done versus what Canada ought to have done. And uh, Canada should be paying the nation back based on what they ought to have done. Okay, now how influential is Southwind going to be? It looks like it's going to be quite influential. Uh, as always with cases like this, any determinant is going to be specific to any particular case. But some experts are comparing Southwind to Guerin, which is an extremely influential case from the 80s. Uh, it relates to how Canada is supposed to pay back specific claims. And with close to 500 still in progress, there's a lot that Southwind could affect. It may be difficult to try and apply it to some of the larger land claims, like the ones that are over $150 million. But um, as some have said, the precedent has been set. So we'll see what happens. All right, now, Josh, in the story, you also visit the Huwait First Nation in BC. What's the connection there? Uh, Huwait had a, their own specific claim ruled on in 2016. The economist Arthur Hosios' model was used for both Huwait and Southwind. Now in Huwait, Canada accepted that decision at a lower court level to try and prevent the precedent being set at a higher court level, but that has now happened in Southwind. Uh, so we go back to the, visit the Huwait and uh, just talk about how that decision came to be, how it influenced Southwind, and how it could influence other specific claim decisions in the future. All right, certainly look forward to the episode, Josh. Thank you so much for joining us here. No problem. Thank you. That's all we have for you tonight on APTN National News. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. Stay tuned for Investigates. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you for joining us, and have a great night.